Good morning. It's good to see you here today. I hope you're doing well. I hope you've had a good week. Um, school has started for at least a day. Um, I've talked to other uh, friends of mine who are in different uh, places, and their school started in different play times, Monday, Tuesday. Some started on Wednesday. I like the idea that we start on Friday, get a day in, get all the you know, things you got to do to get, and then, then you start fresh on Monday. Um, so I think that's good. So today is our backpack blessing. Um, you may not have brought your backpack today, but that's okay because you can get your tag and we can pray over backpacks in absentia, okay? So it's not here, but we're praying. Really, we're praying for your child. And that tag, I hope, parents, that you'll put it on the backpack and that'll be a reminder for your child um, that they are being prayed for. Also, at the end of our service, if you're a teacher here, I'm going to ask that you come forward, and I want to pray over you teachers. Um, I want you to understand something. Sometimes people become teachers just because of the job. But if you look at God's Word, being a teacher is a calling. And it also is a calling that's kind of like, if you're going to do this, make sure you understand what it means. So be a teacher. You don't do it for the money. You don't do it for the money, right? Um, you do it because it is a calling, and you have an impact in young people's lives, I'm telling you. Um, we took Ben to kindergarten, and it was interesting seeing all the students who had been in those teachers' classes who'd run up and say, hey, and they saw their teacher from last year and, and gave them a big hug, or they saw their favorite teacher and, and gave them a big hug. And so you have an impact. And so we're going to pray for you um, at the end of the service after communion uh, before we leave and pray uh, the influence you have. If you're a college professor, you're part of that. Um, so we want you to come up as well because you have an impact in people's lives as well. So as far as announcements go, um, this afternoon, just make a note that we do not have um, Gospel Project because of Sown. Uh, Sunday evening with our neighbors, we go and we feed the uh, homeless people there in Albany at Albany First United Methodist Church. If you're going to be helping with that, you need to be there at the church at 345. We're going to start cooking then, and then they eat at 5, and so you can come. And we had a, a lot of people in the Gospel Project who were helping with that, so we just decided instead of them all missing it, we would start next week. Um, so please make a note of that. No Family Night Supper this week, but in your bulletin, you'll see we've already put it in there for the next week, August the 17th. Um, so if you're going to be a part of that, we'd love for you to come and be a part of that. Um, we're going to have, you can sign up for it this week, and she can keep a record of who all is coming. Um, and uh, we're also going to be sending something out uh, via email where you can uh, fill it out and turn that in as well. Um, but we're going to keep, keep the, the way that we've done it uh, in here as well. And then the last thing I want to lift up is the crochet group that they have. Um, this is an awesome thing. It's a new ministry that they're starting. Um, it's really kind of like a, a small group. They're going to meet together. The information is there. And if you have wanted to be a part of, of, of learning how to do this, this is a wonderful time for you to come and be a part of this. Um, it's really exciting. And, and there it is. And so I hope you'll come and be a part of it um, there. All right, with all that being said, let's stand as we invite God to be a part of our time together. As you're standing, um, please put August the 27th, 20th, August the 20th, um, if you're interested in being part of choir, um, we're going to have kind of a Christmas party where we look at our Christmas cantata, if you can believe it, we're already getting ready for that. Um, it, it's going to be here before you know it. And we'd love for you to come. Maybe you took the summer off. This is a wonderful time for you. You'll be hearing more about this as we kind of get closer to that. Uh, but I did want to put that out there so you would know. And the time for it is 5. It was 6. I think we had it, but they changed it to 5. So please make a note of that as well. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come now into this place, I just thank you, Lord, for... Your hand that always guides us. Your hand that is always with us. Lord, as we focus in on you uh, today, I just pray, Lord, that all we do, all we say, would bring glory and honor to your name. God, we come here carrying burdens. We come here maybe with heavy hearts. We come here with worries for others. Lord, I just pray that we could give those to you and just focus in on your word. 
Lord, speak to our hearts and lives in these moments. We love you so much. Thank you, Father, for being here. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing hymn number 140, which is great is thy faithfulness. You may be seated. Holly Ann and Ruth Ann will come forward at this moment. We're going to bless our young people's backpacks this morning.
at the end of the service, um, if we can have ushers, when we come up for communion, if you could get some of those and just stand back there with them, and then the parents can go as they leave and get their tag. And we want your teachers to get a tag as well, so you can put it on your book bag if you have one or, or somewhere, maybe hang it in your car. I've known some folks who've done that too, just as a reminder that you're being prayed for, um, being prayed over. And so I hope you'll get one as well um, and, and just... And, and we've got plenty, so parents, if you want to get one just to say, hey, I'm going to be reminded to pray for the teachers and for the students, um, I think that's fine too. So as we come to the Lord in prayer again, um, I just want to lift up a praise report. Terry Grinstead, somebody you've been praying for, he had a big test, um, medical test, and that came back okay. Um, and we're thankful for that, um, thankful for that praise. And we have others um, who are fighting the good fight against cancer, um, others who are sick with COVID still. Um, we have others who are shut in, who are lonely, um, and uh, just so many different folks dealing with different things in the life of our church. If you're here today, um, you know we have this part that you can pull out, put your need on there. You can put that in the offering plate. You can put it in our prayer box as you leave back there in the narthex. If you would have something that you need you can go back there and fill that out and, and put it in there when you come in in the morning if you'd like to do that we check those boxes and make sure um, to get those prayer needs um, if it's private you don't want anybody to know about it simply put unspoken um, if you'll put that unspoken need then we will be faithfully praying um, for that need even though we may not know who it is God does um, let's have a moment of silence as we gather our thoughts together and I will lead us in our morning prayer let's pray Heavenly Father, this morning, just this time that we can focus in on you, we can focus in on your um, presence in our lives. Lord, I'm thankful for these book bags that are represented here. Um, the school year is starting. And God, you've already heard uh, Holly Ann and Ruth Ann, and we've prayed and talked about how important um, even young children's presence can be in their school system. Um, so I just pray, Lord, again, a blessing over them, a blessing over our teachers. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would keep them safe and that this year would be the best year they've had, um, whether they're in high school or uh, primary or pre-K. Lord, I just pray that you would bless them um, this school year. Lord, you know we have a lot on our prayer list, people dealing with different things going through different struggles at this time in their lives. There are those who are shut in, Lord, at um, nursing homes. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just put your arms around all of them and that they would feel your presence very real right now. For those who are dealing with medical issues, Lord, whether it's cancer or, or other issues, God, I just pray that you'd be the great physician and you'd bring healing and that you would lift up. Um, those and, and their families, Lord, and just bring a peace that lets everyone know that you're in control. God, we're thankful for this church that we're a part of. Lord, as we move back into the school year, Lord, I just am excited about seeing people come back, um, people connecting with one another. I'm excited about Wednesday night suppers and the opportunity to fellowship in those um, times. Lord, I'm excited about prayer meeting, which we'll be having on Wednesday nights, where we move to pray um, specifically for things that are going on in the life of the church. Lord, I just pray that you would bring all those that would to be a part of this connection so that we can grow together and we can grow stronger as we move into the future and what you've called us to be and how you've called us to make an impact in people's lives, whether that's children, youth, or adults. God, you go before us and show us your will and your way. Lord, we see the news, we see all the things that are going on, we see the drought and the famine and storms and floods, um, we see the, the war and, and rumors of war and all these different things going on, and it, it, it's a heavy burden to carry, wondering what the future holds, wondering what will our children's future be, our grandchildren's future be. Lord, just remind us that as we see these things, um, these things are not... Um, lost on you. You know and you're in control and we can trust you in all of them. Um, you hold the future in your hands and nothing that happens in this world surprises you 
or causes you to worry or fret. You're in control. And because of that truth, we can stand on a solid rock of faith, understanding that you have us just as you have this world. Lord, we trust that and we hold on to that in this life that we live. We love you so much, God, and we can't thank you for the way that you love us. Be with us in the rest of this service. Again, may all we do and say in these moments bring glory and honor to your name. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's continue to worship together as we sing the worship song, Only King Forever. Let's stand as we sing. Father, you are the only king forever. There is none other. There is no one else, just you. And it is right and it is good for us to sing your praises. We can't thank you enough for the way you move in our lives, the way you provide, 
Um, There have been so many times in our lives that we can think of where you have provided when we didn't know where it was going to come from. In the life of this church, there are many times when you provided and we didn't know where it was going to come from. You are a generous God, and we can't thank you enough for your generosity. Lord, we give back to you out of that abundance, and we just pray that you would take these gifts, these offerings, and that you would use them for your kingdom's work. We love you, Lord. Thank you. In your name, amen.
Well, I like new additions to the church, and it's glad to have the Thomases back um, and their little one. She is so precious, and uh, maybe down the road we'll, we'll baptize her and, and we, we get her get her in. I'm uh, looking forward to that. I love little ones. They are the future. Um, they are the life, um, and we need more. Um, we need more kids brought in to the faith. We need more uh, ways to uh, uh, reach the world. And the Bible tells us that uh, part of being parents is raising our children in ways um, that the world will see and the world will know. And uh, I'm thankful for my parents and the role they had in my life. And um, it's just exciting. To have children in our church, youth, young people. It's good to have older people too. <laughs> I'm getting to that point, so. <laughs> it's good for life in the church, let's put it that way, how about that? Life in the church is good. And I'm excited about school getting back, I know the kids aren't so much, and probably teachers aren't so much, but getting back into the swing of things and a football game starting back. Um, I get to see everybody coming into a football game as I'm cooking over there. Um, it's just, it's, it's fun to kind of get back in the swing of things. Um, so, if you've not been here over the last month, missed some, some days, I want to kind of give a recap. We're, we've talked about Acts chapter 2 in the early church. And how the early church devoted itself to certain things. The Holy Spirit had fallen. Um, we're talking about 20, 30 years removed from Jesus, maybe even earlier. Um, this church is growing. Um, Jesus is not like a, a far-off thought. They're still talking to people who met Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who talked to Jesus. And so it's fresh in their mind. So this church um, begins to grow, and it begins to blossom, and it focuses in on four important things. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, Breaking of bread, gathering around the communion table, um, which was part of that process, and then prayer. But all these things focus on one thing, one important thing, and that is the kingdom of God. And so, if you will, if you've got your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. The kingdom of God is a concept that is both now and eternal. Now and eternal. Um, it's now, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember, we say, we say that prayer. It's now, but it's also forever. Um, and I think it's important. The early church understood that. They tapped into that connection and they understood what mattered most. It was the kingdom. So, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, 32 through 40. We're going to kind of look through this and, and break it down. Don't be afraid, verse 32 says, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old. An exhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Let's stop right there. So, you're going to be rooted to something in this life. You're either going to be rooted to the world and all of its wonders, or you're going to be rooted to the kingdom of God, which is a Christian, when you give your life to Christ, you are given the abundant life that John talks about. That abundant life, it's, it's, it's tasting the kingdom of God now, even as it is in heaven. It's getting a glimpse, though it's, it's seen through a mirror dimly, we're getting a glimpse of it. Just a glimpse. But we get that glimpse as children of God. And so we're going to be rooted in one thing or another. Um, I came home the other day, and I have a camellia bush that grows over my neighbor's fence. Not Joey, 
Joey's across the street. And, and my neighbor, bless his heart, he was cutting that half off. Because if, if you have something that hangs over somebody else's fence, you can cut it off. Like I've got some of his pine trees hanging over my, I could go cut that off if I wanted to, and it's, it's legal. And he kind of saw me coming, and he was kind of like, and his wife was right there, and she said, I told him if he did that, you were going to be mad. And I said, I'm not mad, not at all. Because if you've heard me preach, you've heard me talk about the vine that grows up in that bush, right? Now that vine is very much a parasite. What it likes to do is it likes to grow through the bush or tree that it's in. And it gets on top and then it spreads out. And it's got these big leaves and it covers the tree or it covers the bush. And it ultimately will kill it because it takes the sun and everything else. But I'm telling you, to kill one of those vines is a miracle of nature. Now he cut that half off. Now I can mow behind it. And guess what he exposed? That big old potato looking bulb that that vine grows out of. Finally, I can get to the culprit and I can destroy it. And that vine will never grow again, Lord willing. And so I was like, no, I'm not mad. But when you pull them things out, they've got vines, they've got roots that go everywhere. She. Sometimes we as people, as human beings, we want to be connected to God. And we want to be Christian. And we like to say we're Christian. But the only problem is we've not taken our roots out of the world. Our roots are still so deep in this world and the culture and the things that the world finds important. And we try to live in two worlds where we say we're Christians, but we're in love with the world. And as a child of the living God, we can't be that way. Because Jesus says here, and this is Jesus speaking, he says in verse 34, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we say we do all these wonderful things, but our connection is still in the world, Jesus understands that. The rich young ruler, remember him? He comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, Jesus, I've done this, this, and this. All the things that a good Jewish boy should do. Man, I hold to the law. I do all these things. Man, you would love to have me on your team, Jesus. And Jesus says, That's awesome. That's great. I'm glad you do that. I'm glad you go to Sunday school. I'm glad you do all the things you do. But there's one thing I require. Sell everything you got and give it to the poor and follow me. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus started meddling with those roots. Jesus started messing with the roots. You see, for that man, wealth was the root system that he was living under. For him, it was the wealth that made him everything he was. And he could give up everything, but he could not give up that. Because, you see, that's where his heart was. Now, for you, it may not be treasure as far as wealth. I know a lot of people that put a lot of stock in their job. Believe it or not, I I know a lot of people that put a lot of stock in their family over their faith. And if you get that mixed up, it won't work. And you say, "How how can you say that? Because, listen, if I put my family before I put God then I've messed up the equation. Jesus says to those that would follow him, you'll leave family, you'll leave everybody. Remember the time the guy said, let me go bury my father, and he said, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Was he being hard-hearted? No, he wasn't. He was just trying to make them understand what mattered most was being rooted to the kingdom of God, not to this world. The early church understood this. That's why the early church sold all their possessions. Because it didn't matter to them. It wasn't rooted to them. This is not a call for communism. It's a call to understand where our treasure is. And where it isn't. Friends, today, 
as you think about what matters most in your life, is it in your bank account? Is it in the barn? Where is it? If there was one thing that matters most to me in this life, it would be my family. That's the most valuable thing that I have. But even that, I have to surrender to God. They have to be given to Him. Because in my surrendering, I'm putting God first. Because I'm telling you, I can't be the best husband I can be unless God is first in my life. I can't be the best father I can be unless God is first in my life. Unless God is everything for me, you fill in the dot. You can't be the best. You can only be the best you can be. And I'm telling you, the best you can be will always fall shorter than the best you can be in him. That's just the truth. The early church understood that. And everything they did focused about the kingdom here and now. What's the kingdom here and now? It's relationships. When I look across this room, whether I've met you for the first time or whether I've known you for a long time, the only thing I can take with me when I go, the only thing I can take with me if I die tomorrow is my relationships with you. If I die tomorrow, I hope you understand you'll see me again. Because Christ is my all in all. I have surrendered my life to him. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. And the early church didn't preach that. Because no one can be perfect. There are times I fall on my face. There are times I do things I shouldn't do. But I am focused on him. And so when those moments happen, I sense it and I understand you shouldn't have done that. Why did you say that? And I ask for forgiveness. And by his grace, he picks me up and he pushes me forward. That's what communion's all about. It's no wonder that the early church put so much stock in fellowship time. Being together, studying together, eating together. And I loved what we learned when we talked about the table and how after every meal, which kind of broke down the barriers the, of the culture of the day no longer did they follow that culture everybody was welcome everybody had a seat and where you sat didn't matter because you were as much as important as the person who sat at the end of the table and ultimately what they would do when they were done is they would end the meal with having communion where they went back to Jesus which was the ultimate relationship because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, the kingdom is now, and you sense it, even though it may be through a mirror dimly. It is now through relationships. That's why it is so vital that a church be connected with one another, that the church knows each other. I just got to be honest with you for a second. I have struggled after this pandemic I've struggled with people leaving and not coming back I've struggled looking at other churches that seemingly are busting out of the scene but I have come to the conclusion that I cannot be focused on numbers I have got to be focused on relationships because if our church has all the numbers in the world, but we don't know one another, then what point is it? We are to be connected. We are to know each other. And we are to grow together, connected in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we can't get connected as a small church, how in the world can we show people who we are as a kingdom of God? The early church understood that, and they took every effort to be a part of each other's lives. And they grew, and they grew, not in number so much, but in relationship and connection. So... Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also. Moving to 35, be ready for service. 
and have your lamps lit. So relationship is the kingdom connected here and now. Our connection together. But the kingdom is also eternal. And so Jesus says to them, be ready. Be ready. Keep your lamps lit. You've heard me talk about this before, but I want to encourage you to watch it if you haven't. It's a show on, I think it's on Amazon Prime. And it's, I, I can't remember the title of it, but it deals with the Galilean Jewish customs and, and how they did things. They found new archaeological digs around the Sea of Galilee that are showing them that the Galilean Jews did things a little bit differently than other Jewish sects of the day. And why does that matter? Because guess what Jesus was? He was a Galilean Jew. And so a lot of the things Jesus talks about falls into this understanding of the customs of the day. This idea of keeping your lamp lit ties into the wedding. Now I want you to understand, if there was a town and there were two people that were thinking about getting married, the way it kind of all would happen was they would gather together in two groups, the groom's side and the bride-to-be side. And, and, and the bride and groom would kind of haggle, and the parents would haggle, and they would talk about um, everything, and, and, and it would come to a place where finally everything was set, the families agreed, and the final thing was the groom-to-be would take a cup of wine, and he would say, this is my cup. And if the bride agreed with everything that went down, the bride would take it, and she would take a drink. And he would say, this is the cup of my body. In essence, what he was saying was, do you accept me? And she would take a drink, and she would say, yes, I do accept you. You see the imagery there? Doesn't that fall into some things Jesus said? Yes, it does. It falls into line with what we do after we're done in communion. And so they would have this thing, and then the groom was excited, woo! And then the father would say, go and get ready. Because you see, the wedding date was only known by the father. How do you like that, women? Natalie, I'm the one that's gonna set the wedding date. <laughs> and so the only one that, not even the groom, not even the son of the, the son of the father knew. Only the father. This is custom for Galilean Jews. And they would live ready. The bride would stay with their bridesmaids. It could be up to a year. And they would live ready. The groom, he would be ready. And finally, the day would come when everything was as it needed to be. And the father of the bride, the groom, would look at the groom and say, go blow the shofar. It's time. It's time. And he would blow the shofar, and everybody in that community knew it was time for the wedding. And they would go, and they had better have oil in their wicks for their lamp. They had better be ready. And they would come one by one, those that were ready, and they would go into the Father's house. And one by one, after everyone had come, once the Father closed the door, nobody else could come in. It was closed. It was finished. People could knock. People could try. But the door would not open. What an image. And this is Galilean custom. This is not even getting into what Jesus is talking about. But this is what he's talking about. Being ready. Are you ready? If you live in the kingdom now, you're going to be ready for the kingdom to come. If you make Jesus center of all your life, if you make his relationship the most important thing, and then all the other relationships come together, you're going to be ready when that shofar blows. And it will blow. I don't know when, but it will. It will blow. Listen to this. Be ready for the service and have your lamps lit. You must be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet. So that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him. Those servants the master will find alert 
when he comes will be blessed, I assure you. He will get ready, have them recline at the table, then come and serve them. If he comes in the middle of the night or even near dawn and finds them alert, those servants are blessed. But know this, if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let the house be broken into. You also be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. This is Jesus talking. Jesus even said, I don't know, only the Father knows. But there will be a day when God the Father will look at Jesus the Son and he will say it's time. And the shofar will blow and we will see, I don't know, I've got these thoughts in my head what it's going to look like if I'm still alive. But we will see the King in all of his glory. And all of those that have gone before, their bodies will meet with their spirits and rise up out of the grave. It wouldn't hurt my feelings as I, if I was out there in the cemetery. And Bobby came up out of that grave. And all the others that I've buried out there in that cemetery. And all their glory. And then those that are left will be called up. And those that didn't know Jesus, he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Why does knowing the kingdom here and now in relationship matter so much? Because, friends, you're the ones that are called to share the good news. You're the ones who are going to talk to those and share about this relationship. But listen, it's got to start with us. We have got to be connected. We, the church, have, bought a, have got to get connected. There are opportunities for you to do that. Oh, it would please your pastor so if you would just come and be a part of those times. Wednesday night suppers, prayer meeting, sown, worship, Wednesday, food pantry, clothes closet. There are opportunities for you to connect. Youth and children on Wednesdays and Sundays when we do those different things. When those programs are available or whatever they do, look at it and be a part of it. As we grow and as we get connected. But it takes all of us, church. It takes all of us. We've got to be willing to put ourselves out there. We've got to be willing to be connected we got to be willing to start those relationships. Some of the best times that I remember as a kid growing up in the church is when people would invite us to go eat after church. In the church I grew up in, there were a lot of different families, and they were always kind of hooking up, inviting each other to come eat. Hey, let's go eat. Where do you want to go? And we'd go. And my parents would sit there and talk, and, and then I would sit there and talk. And then when my dad quit preaching for a season, you know, it's one thing to invite the preacher to eat. Everybody's got to invite the preacher, right? But when we started at Winona Park, and my dad was teaching Sunday school, we got invited. Other people invited us to go be a part. And we did. So maybe you're here today. And you're thinking about this, and you're thinking, where's my treasure? My treasure's in something else. My treasure is in my job, my retirement. My treasure's in my kids, and I haven't put God in that. My treasure, you fill in the blank. If that's you, let's, let's cut the roots, and let's get rooted in Him. Because I'm telling you, when you get rooted in Him, all those things will fall into place. Your job, your family, your children, all that will be good if you're rooted in Him. Maybe you're here today and you say, I am rooted in Him, and I know that. Amen. Praise God. Maybe what you need to do is be the one that invites somebody to come eat. Maybe you're the one that needs to step out in faith and say, hey, hey, what are you doing after church today? You want to go with us to the restaurant? Maybe that's what you need to do. 
the one that takes the first step. Maybe you've been waiting for somebody to invite you, but you need to take the step to invite them to go with you. Maybe that's how the connection's made. I don't know. Maybe it's, hey, I'm going to Wednesday night supper um, on the 17th. Would you come with me? I, I've noticed you haven't been. I'd love for you to come and sit with me. I'll be there. And you've created this space for you to connect. Hey, have you been to prayer meeting? I would love for you to come to prayer meeting. with. We, we just pray. The preacher won't call on you if you don't want to pray. Don't feel embarrassed. Just come and pray with us. Maybe you're in a women's Bible study. And, and you, hey, we've got this women's Bible study. We'd love for you to come. Maybe you're going to learn to crochet. Hey, that sounds fun. Would you join me in crocheting? Miss Dale's going to do it. <laughs> Connecting. That's the thing that we're supposed to do. Because if we connect with one another, if we get that down, you'll be surprised how you start connecting with the world. Pulling people. Caring for people. Loving people. Teachers. Students, wherever you work, you have an opportunity. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, is both now and eternal. As we come for Holy Communion, I pray you take all these things we've talked about and you focus in on him. Because he's the heartbeat of the kingdom, right? The heartbeat of the kingdom of God. What would you think if you could be a part of this blessed country where the king is good and more than that, the king is offered that all of his people not just be his subjects, but be his children. And this king is not just a good king, but he is a king that loves with a love that we've never known. In fact, this king loves so much, he gave his prince to pay the penalty that you and I should have paid. And that prince gave his life willingly for you and for me. And because of his death, he reconnected us to the kingdom of God. And what was lost in the garden has been restored. And the early church understood this. And when they would eat, and when they would fellowship, when they connect, they'd come back, and at the end of it, they'd say, let's focus in on Jesus now. And let's remember what he's done. And as Wesleyans, we don't just remember, we receive his grace. Fresh and new. So if you've messed up, guess what? This is your altar call, right? I had a professor, and I think I've told you this before, but... Dr. Tuttle, I loved him. He was the guy that would sneak into the Catholic Church and take communion, even though he wasn't supposed to. Because you have to be a Catholic to take communion in Catholic churches. And so he would sneak in, and he said, I did it. And he said, they never knew it. But he'd always say, you never have to do an altar call if you offer communion. Because at the table of God, there's always grace and forgiveness. Good news. That's the kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am thankful for the kingdom of God. I am thankful that I am a part of it. And it's not something that we have to wait to be a part of when we die. You have offered that kingdom to us now, here, as it is in heaven. And we can have that abundant life, and we can be connected to that kingdom, no matter how old or how young we are. Lord, you shared this thought in this passage in Luke about treasure and what matters most to us. Where are our roots? Are our roots firmly planted in this world and all the things the world has to offer, like the rich young ruler? Or are things, our life planted in the kingdom of God, where moth and, and, and worm cannot destroy? The early church understood this, and they were willing to sell all they had to put in one pile so they could be the kingdom. Lord, I don't think you're calling us to do that now in this world, but you are calling us to put you first. You're all calling us to forsake all other things so that we can have the kingdom. Lord, knowing this, as we 
take on that kingdom here and now, may we also be ready for that day when the kingdom eternal comes together with the kingdom now. And we live our lives eternally with you in your kingdom come. Lord, I can't wait for that day. I've got folks I want to see on the other side, as do many here today. And the hope and the truth we have is that they no longer see through the mirror dimly. They see all clearly. And Lord, there will be a day when we will too. Help us to be ready for that day. Help us to be ready when the shofar blows. As we come now to this holy communion table, meet us here, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Remind us of who you are and what you've done. Remind us of forgiveness and grace that is found here in this moment. We love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> On the night in which Jesus met with his disciples, I want you to kind of get this. The early church sitting around the table, they've had time of fellowship. And then one of the leaders says, do you remember? Jesus met with the disciples in the upper room. Do you remember when he took the bread? And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. remember that and they probably looked at one another and said it still amazes me what he said his body they didn't know what that meant but we do and they did at the early church they did take him they did beat him they did whip him they did put a crown of thorns on his head they did nail him to a tree his body was bruised, broken for you and for me. Jesus said, my body broken for you. That same night, at the end, they took the cup. And the leader said, this is the cup of the new covenant. The blood of our Christ shed for you and for me. The new covenant, the covenant of Christ. No longer are we all under the ugly covenant of the law, but now we're under the grace of Christ. Jesus forgives. His grace is fresh and new. The blood washes white as snow. If I poured this grape juice on me, it would be purple. <laughs> when I went to Israel, they gave us a little wooden hand-carved uh, communion cup. And when I got it, I soaked it in grape juice. Actually, I soaked it in wine. And when it was all done, it was purple. And you think, why did you do that? Because I wanted to be reminded of what Jesus did for me. And that little purple cup is always a reminder of what it is and what it represents. Jesus said this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. There's grace in that statement. Grace for you and for me. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on these elements of bread and wine. That you would let them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed. Lord God, we take this moment and we remember what you've done. We remember the sacrifice, the love that you had for us. And we come to this place and we receive your grace new. Forgiveness found at the cross of Calvary. Lord, whatever we've done um, this week where we messed up, maybe we looked at things we shouldn't have looked at, maybe we said things we shouldn't have said, maybe we were ugly to someone, maybe our spouse and we got in fights, well, who knows? But we lay all that down at the foot of the cross and we ask for forgiveness and we receive it. And we get up new and fresh and we go out into the world and do what you call us to do. Much like a father picking up that child who's fallen off the bike, you wipe us off and you say, keep going. And we do. Lord, as we come to this place, meet us here. Speak to us about where our treasure lies. Speak to us about the kingdom here and now and the relationships that we could connect with and be a part of. Speak to us about being ready for that day 
and the shofar comes and the kingdom eternal melts with the kingdom now. And all we'll know is being with you. We love you, Lord. Be here now with us in your precious name. Amen. Would those that are going to be helping this morning come forward? Mary, this is the body of Christ broken for you. It is. The blood of Christ shed for you. It is. This is my body. This is the blood of Christ. Lord, I just thank you for the willingness to serve. But more than that, I pray, Lord, that their faces would shine with Christ's face so that those that are being served will see you. And those that are being served, I pray they would shine with Christ's face so that those that are serving will see you. Lord, this is about you as we all meet you here. Meet us. At this table, Lord, we pray in your precious name. Amen. In the Methodist Church, you don't have to be a member of this church to come. You just come with a repentant heart. All are welcome to the table of God. All. Um, when they ate in that early church, everybody sat around, the children, everybody. And when it came time for communion, they didn't tell the children to leave. They wanted the children to hear. They wanted them to get it kind of seeped in so that they grew up understanding what it was all about. And what it's all about, it's all about the love of God. Amen? I had uh, a woman one time in the church I served and and when I would break bread, I would often get it all over the floor. And she'd say, you just get that bread everywhere. And it is a mess. And I loved her to death. But I said, you know what? Communion is messy. But Jesus dying on the cross was pretty messy too. I think all of it kind of molds us into a place where we understand what Jesus did. So listen, if you drop it, if you get a little juice on the carpet, there's been a lot of juice on this carpet over the years. <laughs> the more juice, maybe we can get some new carpet somewhere. I don't know. But don't worry about it. It's part of it. It's part of what we're doing here. Amen? Follow the ushers. The table is open. I pray that you'll come.
commercial is it in you you know have you seen that that's a pretty cool ad you know they're sweating and the Gatorade's coming out is he in you is he in you is he in you are you rooted in him yes what an image for us holy communion rooted in him filled with him going out in the world to be his hands, his feet. Amen? All right, teachers, we're going to close out with prayer with you. If you will, teachers, come forward, please. If you're a teacher in, in college, don't be shy. Come on. Sarah's a teacher. Come on, Sarah. Doctor. leave anybody out all right what you do is not just a job do you understand that it's not look in the Bible it's a calling the calling of teacher a spiritual gift it is and I know you live in a different world where maybe once you could have talked about Jesus' love and you could do the things that you used to do but you can't do that anymore so how do you do it? By the way you treat your kids. By the way you love them in spite of some maybe not being very lovable. <laughs> right? Well, truth. I mean, it's honest. But that's what ca Jesus calls us to do. And you may be the only Christ-like influence that your students are going to see this year. You might be the only one. So we are going to be praying for you as you lead these students this year, whatever system you're in, whatever age level you teach, and that you are a light. And my greatest prayer for you is that you're the teacher that your student wants to come back and see. You're the one. I remember her. I remember counselors that had an impact on me. I remember school nurses that had an impact on me. I remember people who were Christ-like that had influences on me all throughout my school. Do y'all remember people like that? Those were the people. So I want you, congregation, to kind of, in a figure, to put your arms forward like you're, you're sending prayers, you're touching them. All right? You guys touch them. Let's put it out there. All right. We're going to pray for y'all. And I want you to get one of those little clips to put somewhere so you'll remember what you do and that we're praying for and you got your back. Okay? Let's pray and we'll close out our time. Lord, I am thankful for this Sunday. I know we've gone long, but there's a lot we did. I am thankful, God, for these uh, women here uh, that are teaching in different school systems, teaching at different schools. we got a school nurse here, Lord, who has an impact in all the students' lives. We have a, a, a professor, Lord, who has an impact in older people, uh, younger people. And I just, I just thank you, God, for their touch, the way that they can have an influence in people's lives. Use them this year, God. Keep them safe. When their strength grows weary, and I know it probably will. When their tension gets a little bit tight, and I know it probably will. When their frustration grows, and I know it probably will. I pray that you would be the light in their heart and life. And because they're rooted in you, they will make a difference in these young people's lives. Lord, we love you. We love them. And we honor them. And we lift them up and pray for them. Be with us as we leave this place, filled with your presence. Use us for your kingdom, we pray. In your precious name, amen. You are dismissed. Don't forget to get your book bag back.